Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian O'Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Lindsay Barrett, a staff attorney and teaching fellow at the Georgetown University Law Center Institute for Public Representation, Communications, and Technology Clinic. We will discuss her article, Confiding in Con Men, U.S. Privacy Law, the GDPR, and Information Fiduciaries, which was published in the Seattle University Law Review. So welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I, I really, this is a really cool and very timely article because I think it's an issue that's very much on people's, people's minds right now. And, and in the article, you address data privacy law in the United States and Europe as well as kind of potential alternative approaches or ways of thinking about how we should enforce and regulate data privacy. So, so I wonder if you could start by just talking about what things are like now. So what is data privacy law and regulation currently like in the United States? Like who, who is responsible for kind of regulating data privacy and kind of how is it how, is, how does it conceptualize its role? So I think uh, one, of the, uh, one of the key things to understand about privacy law in the United States is uh, that there isn't a, it's, it's both one of the most um, basic facts, but also says a lot about kind of the motivations behind our privacy laws and kind of the philosophy that um, they represent. And that's that we don't have a comprehensive privacy law. Um, we have a bunch of state and, and federal sectoral statutes, so um, laws regulating things like uh, educational information, health information, uh, children's online information, uh, driver's licenses, genetic information, and um, then you have the FTC, which um, regulates unfair and deceptive practices. So that serves as something of a catch-all, but their jurisdiction doesn't extend to some companies that still um, are relevant to privacy. So in particular, um, common carriers like telecoms. So the result is, um, and then there's, there's also the fact that um, US pri or privacy isn't, uh, privacy from companies isn't protected by the US constitution, so, or, or excuse me, um, privacy from an entity that is not the government is not protected by the US constitution. So it's, um, there's a range of protections coming from tort law, from these sectoral statutes, from the FTC's enforcement, from state AG's enforcement. And it's kind of a constellation of um, various of various laws working together. But the, the lack of a comprehensive law means that um, the default is that something uh, that companies can collect data as opposed to the default being that they have to have justification for it. Um, and the the other part of, of um, the way that privacy is regulated in the United States that I think really informs a lot of the legislative uh, attempts or how, how the law works and kind of the weaknesses of US privacy protections is this conception of uh, privacy as kind of a commodity that people should be able to trade away as opposed to a right. And, you know, we've, by framing it in that way, it's easier for various entities, be it companies or trade associations, uh, regulators who don't want to regulate very stringently to say, oh, okay, it's, you know, the, the thing that we're talking about, it's not as uh, fundamental and um, the imperative for uh, the government to get involved is not as significant um, when you're talking about something that you should be able to trade away because what what is the harm really as opposed to you know you have a right to vote you have a right to uh, to free expression you have a right to any of the things that we kind of discuss in that framing so um, the what I try to do in the paper is kind of discuss how how privacy is regulated and how how it's approached in the U.S. how it's um, how it's approached in Europe because I, I wrote this on the occasion of um, the Seattle University um, Law School's uh, GDPR symposium and um, 
how how can U.S. law enact protections that kind of move us closer to protecting privacy as a right? Mm-hmm. Well, so it, I mean, it sounds like U.S. privacy data privacy regulation is pretty dispersed and pretty kind of ad hoc in some ways, but but also that well, they're both good descriptions. <laughs> But also that it's, it, I mean, it sounded, it sounds like from your, from, from what you just said, as well as from my reading of the paper that, you know, the FTC does play a sort of kind of important role in relation to whatever kind of data privacy regulation there actually is in the United States. I wonder if you could talk just really briefly, more specifically about the FTC itself and how you see the FTC conceptualizing its mandate in relation to data privacy regulation and also, I guess, data privacy kind of protection more specifically? Like, what does the FTC think it can and should do in that respect? Yeah, so the FTC plays an enormous role, um, both because they are, um, the agency enforces some of the privacy laws that we have on the books, like um, COPPA, or uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which um, we work a lot with at um, IPR and um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act and a couple others. And with their um, Unfair and Deceptive Practices Authority, they um, police the promises, uh, particularly with the, um, they primarily rely on their deceptive uh, deception authority. But um, in using that, they um, police the promises that companies make about um, their practices. So you know, do you, what do you collect? What do you tell people collect, that you collect? What are the representations that a reasonable consumer, um, w- how, how would the reasonable consumer interpret the representations that a company is making? And I think in terms of approach, it's, <laughs> it's tricky because in, in advocacy land, you know, part of, um, part of our job is pointing out the space between what is, or really our whole job, is pointing out the what could be done and what could be done better. And I, I, I'm always a little bit reticent to just simply yell, "The FTC is useless. Throw it into the sea," because that's not what I mean. Um, but it has had a bit of a spotty track record in terms of um, of protecting privacy, and there's a range of, um, you know, there's speculation as to why that is one one is certainly um there is there's some gaps in their authority that make a big difference so the ftc doesn't have broad rulemaking authority um they have it for um the graham leach Bliley um act they i believe um they have it for um coppa but they don't use it that that often and they don't have it writ large so in if the ftc is you know they have their they have their experts and they convene other experts and in their measured judgment they decide hmm you know here's some scary area of privacy that is falling through the gaps of the of the statutes we have it would be good to set out a, a base standard they can do that in little ways they they offer guidance they have workshops they can fill in the blanks but they don't have that rulemaking authority to set out new ground. Um, so there's that. They don't have civil penalty authority writ large, again. So for certain um, certain laws give them that authority. If you, like COPPA, for example, um, if a company violates COPPA, the FTC can find them right off the bat. But if a company engages in an unfair or deceptive practice, um, the, what the FTC will typically do is um, bring them under a consent order and the end result is, well, if you do X, Y, and Z again, then you get fined, which is, in terms of setting up incentives, um, a problem. Um, another thing is they are pretty outpaced in terms of uh, size and resources of the problems that they're facing. Um, I'm going to forget the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it, it was something like the FTC has I think 40 full-time staff devoted to privacy because also the FTC does a lot of other things, you know, contact lenses and, you know, whole, whole realm of trade beyond the cyber. Um, but 
um, I think they have something like 40 full-time staff devoted to privacy. And then you can compare that to the um, British Data Protection Authority that has um, 100 full-time staff devoted to the FTC investigation alone. Like that's a that's a bananas comparison. And also we're quite a bit bigger. So um, there's certainly a lot of context to be drawn there in terms of the tools that they have. But then there's how they could be using the tools that they have, which isn't as aggressive as, anywhere near as aggressive as they could be. Um, it depends on um, the approach of different commissioners. So you'll have someone, um, yeah, and you know that'll obviously track with regulatory philosophy and you know the the party that's in power, all of that. Um, so it's not as though all all FTC commissioners think that the FTC shouldn't be aggressively using its authority. Um, but then you'll have others who are stressing regulatory humility and saying, well, you're saying at you know FTC hearings, well, privacy isn't a right, and we can't, you know, that it's not a Thing that we should go off and being go off and protect just for the sake of it, and you know there's a space between because uh, the the agency also has a competition mandate, so there's you know a lot of varying equities to keep in mind in terms of how they how they pursue enforcement and how they design their rules. Um, but one would hope that the agent that the agency basically in charge of U.S. privacy thinks that it's an important thing to protect. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think it's, there's a problem of, I think under this administration, um, there's obviously, you know, throughout various agencies, there's a tendency to, to let the foxes rule the hen house. And sometimes that's more, uh, I'd say it's a lot more egregious in other areas. Um, but there the FTC isn't using its authority as vigorously as it could be and that is that in addition to the fact that its authority and uh, size is outpaced by the scale of the problem um, does help answer why you know the state of the privacy ecosystem is as bad as it, is as bad as it is mm -hmm. well so in your paper you, compare U.S. data privacy regulation to data privacy regulation in the EU with sort of the data protection, the general data protection regulation under EU law, the GDPR, mm -hmm. sort of being the, the primary point of comparison. And, and it really sounded to me like, I mean, there are profound practical differences in terms of how EU regulatory authorities approach data privacy protection, but also it seems like maybe some really kind of deep philosophical differences and sort of the underlying premises of the various regulatory uh, mandates. I wonder if you could talk briefly and kind of in a general sense about what you see as being the sort of differences uh, between EU privacy law as compared to U.S. privacy law. I mean, where do those differences come from and why are they important? There definitely are. Um, I think, um, and there's a lot of um, really um, brilliant, brilliant comparative scholars who have written on this. Um, one one article that I found deeply instructive as I was writing this is one by um, uh, Schwartz and Pfeiffer. It's Transatlantic Data Privacy Law. I think it's in the Georgetown Law Journal. But kind, um, another is by Chris Hufnagel and two. Um, uh, two co-authors on the GDPR and just kind of taking a thousand feet um, step back and kind of saying, all right, this is this is the the motivation behind the GDPR and that's how it squares with kind of the U.S. regulatory philosophy and here are, here are the difference and that's how it translates into these uh, specific provisions. But I mean, the the main one is the fact that the that the GDPR protects privacy and data protection as a constitutional right um, from rather privacy and data protection um, as applied to entities beyond just the government um, as a fundamental right. And another is the fact that the GDPR is a comprehensive law as opposed to this, you know, scattershot arran arrangement of um, various sectoral statutes. And of course, so the GDPR 
the way that it works is companies then implement what um, their own versions of um, what the law requires them to have. So, you know, in various in various areas, um, you'll have some regional variations, but um, overall, you know, but the the comprehensive versus sectoral um, approach is a pretty big distinction, as is just the the agreement that privacy is something valuable and worth protecting as opposed to something trivial that should be weighed not let me backtrack um it's not as though um your the european discussions around privacy don't consider competition and um business practices and you know innovation and all of that um they do and the text of the gdpr does um but the approach to privacy as a as a right kind of grounds the policy discussions around just what the ba the baseline of what should be allowed and what is important um, in a way that I'm hoping the policy discussions in the U.S. are moving towards, but we've struggled to do. So you have, um, you know, people who will talk about the so-called privacy paradox, the idea that if you know, because people express a, um, a strong views about privacy in surveys, but then they don't take strong, um, they, they don't translate that into their conduct. That means that they don't really care about privacy. And then, you know, extrapolate from that to, oh, well, if people don't really care about privacy and it's not a right, then why do we care about it? Like, what is the, what is the point of regulating it? And when you are in that, in that framing of, you know, privacy is trivial. There is no, um, there is no kind of imperative to have strong protection for it. It's very easy to argue against them, um, particularly in on a topic that's difficult for people to understand and 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 see see and really visualize the way that um, you know everyday steps that they take can ultimately be harmful. So the the quote unquote privacy paradox, you know, of course people don't take the privacy the privacy steps that perfectly reflect their preferences and expectations because it's impossible. Um, we are living in a highly consolidated ecosystem where if you, you know, if you don't like the, if you think the service that you're using is creepy, uh, you may or you probably don't have an alternative to it. Um, the way that privacy is regulated in the United States primarily um, is some, something called uh, notice and choice. So the idea that if you're, if a company discloses its privacy practices to you in a, you know, 0.11 light gray font on a website you can't find, that you've been put on notice and there, therefore you you as an autonomous consumer can go out into the world and make your choices. Um, but again, that belies just basic facts about how real people think and act because people don't read privacy policies and that's a rational choice. That makes sense because you encounter way too many of them in a day for that to be a sensible choice. Um, they often don't say what you need to know. Um, and just in so many ways, people are not put in a position where they're able to make choices that reflect um, their privacy preferences. So the it's, it's frustrating to kind of have to constantly try and reframe why privacy matters and have have it almost said as as like a a laughing talking point that oh well most people think it don't think it think it doesn't um when you know well yeah but most people don't know how to you know what level of chemicals in their paint can hurt them most people don't know exactly you know what um how long their meat should um, would be acceptable for their meat to be refrigerated before something else could happen like there's so many other harms in the world that we don't expect people to be able to fully understand and gauge for themselves that um, this, uh, this this understanding of privacy is 
you know, something that people should be able to always trade away um, really ignores. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so this is one thing that really struck me about your paper is this sort of, you sort of offer this, if I if, if I may, sort of like a characterization of sort of two different visions of data privacy, where in the United States, we have a kind of property-like conception of privacy where it's like a it's like a, a property right that you can that consumers can trade away in exchange for value or something like that it, whereas whereas in Europe it seems as if there's a more sort of inalienable concept of of privacy and and it struck me that you you're kind of at least at one level you seem to be arguing that you know, to the extent that we think, you know, to the extent that you think in the first place that people should be able to trade away privacy rights at all, they don't really seem to necessarily be fully cognizant or aware of what they're actually trading away in the first place. And that maybe they need sort of some sort of interne intermediary at the very least to be looking out for their best interests in context. So I think so. In terms of privacy as property, I, I, I wouldn't say that that's, that it, I, I, care, I do characterize it as, um, you know, the U.S. law treats or policy discourse can often treat privacy as a commodity and obviously a commodity can be property. There's also this whole um, kind of body of property law and um, there, there have been attempts to explicitly map kind of actual property law onto privacy rights and, you know, pay people for their data, all of that. I don't think that that's a productive way forward because, again, people are not put in a position to make those judgments accurately. And you also get, get kind of into a, um, you know, normative, you know, what, what do we think people should be able to um, trade away about themselves? Like um, Sarah Jiang had this fantastic op-ed the other day um, going discussing kind of the privacy as property proposals and comparing it to previous ip cases with um you know why we don't always let people sell their organs like that that kind of thing or or we don't let people sell their organs <laughs> well well I mean, it it just struck me that that this sort of dichotomy and and i agree that it's a really it's a super loose one but it seems to tie into this kind of fushier idea that you discuss in the paper in the sense that, you know, we're sort of, in a sense, like throwing consumers into the deep end without knowledge of what's actually taking place and that, you know, somebody ought to be looking out for their best interests. And, you know, maybe we ought to be deputizing or obligating some of these intermediaries to act uh, in their best interests. Yeah. So it's, it's not an intermediary in, in so far as, a someone who is coming in between you and the entity that is possibly threatening your privacy. Um, but what I like about the information fiduciary model is one, it, and I should, should also, I go through this in the paper, but um, this is certainly not something that I plucked out of the ether. Um, this is a, uh, an idea that um, Professor Jack Bul um, Balkan and Jonathan Zittrain and others have um, proposed and written about um, and that I then wrote about in the context of the GDPR and how I think the information fiduciary model could be the most effective. And I differ with um, professors Balkan and Zitrain on some on a few points. Um, but the the main thing that I that I see as being valuable about the fiduciary model is that it it simply moves the presumption uh, um, that there is no obligation writ large, you know, in, in, in the way that we have currently in this sectoral system of, oh, well, does it not fit under the exact designation of genetic information that an employer is using to possibly discriminate against you in an employee decision, whatever it is, um, and says, no, if a, if a company is collecting your information and putting you in this position um, where you have, um, where they're performing a specialized skill that you can't perform for yourself, um, you are unable to adequately supervise what they're doing with it. You're trusting them with um, your sensitive information. Um, that 
in general, the presumption should be that there are duties there. Um, another reason why I think it's an effective approach is it can also, the applying duties of loyalty and care and confidentiality can encompass a broader um, range of digital harms than um, other approaches do because you know when we're when we're talking about how companies use your information um, in ways that can be harmful, we're also talking about discrimination and we're talking about manipulation and you know as it, data breaches are are a part of this. You know what what we traditionally understand as as privacy harms, you know unwanted disclosure that kind of thing is certainly covered, but a duty of loyalty can extend further than just um, you need to get my permission under X circumstances to share my information with Y. Um, and another another reason why I thought or why I think it um, is a it would be helpful for the way that U.S. law currently approaches privacy is you know with traditional fiduciaries. The idea was here, so you have the the specialized skill, the person who's unable to perform it for themselves, the inability to supervise, creating an incentive to um, the exchange of sensitive information, and then that creates an incentive for the person who is providing the skill to um, exploit that position to their advantage if they want to, unless there are consequences. Um, the public policy recognition of well, we don't want that to happen. One, because it's normative; those abuses are normatively bad, and two, because we these are relationships we want to to foster. We want to make sure that people can go to doctors. We want to make sure people can go to lawyers, and um, it it acknowledges a, a sensitivity and a vulnerability, and just a a gravity of uh, something that is worth protecting in a way that, as as I was saying before. Um, kind of the U.S. discourse around policy often lacks. Um, and it moves both, an information fiduciary model takes this broader approach. It can encompass, it can encompass um, a broader sense of privacy harms, but it also, it, it kind of adds this moral valence to why privacy protections are important. Mm -hmm. So, so essentially what you're saying is that we've got a kind of model, a conceptual model for a fiduciary in a lot of these usually like professional contexts where you have people with specialized information who are providing services to people who lack that information. And so we put additional duties on the fiduciaries with the information to look out for the best interests of the people that they're working with. And it seems like in a lot of ways, these data intermediaries, these companies gathering and managing data uh, provided to them by, by consumers are in a similar position in the sense that they have a much richer and deeper and broader understanding of the value and consequences associated with the information that they're collecting and managing than do the people from whom they're receiving it. And as a consequence, we should impose similar kinds of heightened duties to their customers. Yeah, uh, that, that's a pretty, yeah, it's a good summary. Um, basically, I mean, they're in kind of trying to apply, you know, old frameworks to new contexts. You always want to make sure that the that the principles are applicable to the new context. So when we're saying, you know, what what is a doctor's duty to their patient? What is a lawyer's duty to their client? Obviously, there is going to be ways in which you distinguish, okay, how how is Uber's duty to me um, more or less, um, what, is, what is the basis for that? And, you know, this, the <laughs> reasoning by analogy, like what, what we all do for a living. Um, but when it comes to uh, to data collectors, I think one one thing that is Im important to keep in mind is as much as lawyering or um, practicing medicine can seem uniquely uh, so what I'm looking for I suppose sensitive isn't the wrong one, but um, the duty seems particularly heightened. 
the the ability of a tech company to manipulate and discriminate and use your information against you i th- um also shouldn't be taken lightly Mm -hmm. Well, and and in your paper, you give several different examples of particular kinds of, I guess, harms or actions that companies could take that we might perceive as harmful or at the very least inconsistent with the sort of heightened duty we associate with a fiduciary relationship. I wonder if you could like give a couple examples of how uh, adopting a fiduciary model might sort of distinguish between, you know, what would be appropriate for companies to do under that model, as opposed to what we might see as kind of permissible, even if distasteful under the current regulatory model. Yeah. So I think there, there's a couple things. So one, and this is something I try to emphasize in the paper, um, the best law in the world is useless if it's not enforced. So that that's true, whether you have a fiduciary model, whether whatever approach approach you're going to take to regulating privacy. Um, The other is um, so much of privacy law that is actually applicable to data collectors and that is actually enforced comes down to the FTC's um, use of its deception authority and which can in a in a in a, a flippant description can be described as don't lie it's, you know as if you're telling people that you're invading their privacy that's fine just don't lie about it so um, one one example would be you know an app that does whatever creepy thing that it does and in the privacy policy it says it tells you you know we we use this information and um you know describes it in these kind of bland terms that a person wouldn't necessarily associate with whatever they're actually doing with it and you know provided they have described that in a way that isn't wholly and enormously misleading um, and some other uh, statute doesn't apply, then, and then also the FTC, like whether or not, you know, there are companies that are that are breaking the law every day, and it it's down to whether the FTC or state AGs feel like actually doing something about it. So um, you could have a um, a an app. So for instance, one one app that I that I find particularly disturbing is. Um, Ovia, it's a pregnancy and fertility app that, you know, works with employers and gives employers information as to what employees search for and, you know, what it call an uh, aggregate statistics, all of that. And, oh, wow. You know, oh, yeah. And then when we're <laughs> the aggregate, like, oh, think about how many, like, women of, you know, broadly considered, like, reproductive likelihood are in an office at a, at a given time and how big that office might be. Like, how? how anonymized do we really think this is? Um, so in that case, you know, HIPAA doesn't apply because it's not an electronic health record that's held by, um, I'm forgetting the, the precise language of the statute, but doesn't apply. Um, and I haven't read their privacy policy recently, but it, unless it says, you know, we absolutely don't share your information with anybody under any circumstances, and then it does that, you know, they're pretty much in the clear. Mm. And th- that is despite the fact that, you know, we live in a world where pregnancy discrimination is rampant and that this is creating a, it, this is fa- facilitating the ability of employers to, you know, it's not, it's probably not um, pushing anyone to do something that they weren't inclined to do already, but it's helping them do it. Mm. And, you know, that is something that I think under that a duty of care could apply to. Um, Mm. Whereas under our current privacy laws, you know, with the, uh, how narrow the sectoral definitions are, um, how narrow the FTC's approach to what a privacy harm is and when they should actually get involved and just their limited resources. um, You know, that app is, that, that company is going around and, doing what they're doing so 
Mm-hmm. Well, and and if I remember correctly, you, you gave a couple of interesting potential examples of companies potentially like subtly influencing people's political or ideological decisions by way of kind of using data to anticipate the kind of circumstances they may find themselves in, which it seems like might be permissible under our current approach, but inconsistent with fiduciary duties to customers. So I think depending on the circumstance and depending on, you know, uh, it depends, you know, a million different things, but um, because we, with defining kind of manipulation and the extent to which that would that would violate a duty of care, you also want to think about, all right, what definition isn't going to just cover all of advertising? Because advertising in general is a, you know, the goal is to persuade, but when are you, what is the line between persuasion and taking advantage of a vulnerability in order to um, re- rely on that vulnerability to the person's um, uh, detriment and the company's advantage. So one definition um, based on a couple on from, uh, from some other scholars that I discussed in the paper is um, a persuasive tactic targeted to the user designed to exploit her vulnerability and intended to change her conduct or outlook when the interests of the subject and the provider diverge should constitute manipulation and could violate either the duty of loyalty or the duty of care. And you know that can that can ultimately take a number of forms. So some something that we've that has become a heightened uh, focus for the scholars and policymakers of late is this idea, uh, and computer scientists, um, this idea of dark patterns. So um, kind of product architecture that is, again, designed to um, uh, prey on cognitive vulnerabilities and get you to make a decision that you might not otherwise make that would, that benefits um, someone to your detriment. So uh, mm-hmm. think about any airline website you have ever used in your life. Um, and also the way pretty much any privacy policy is, is um, constructed in that they're hard to read. They are hard to find. And um, any setting, default settings that are designed to get you to share more information that you intend, than you intend. Um, all, all of these things can um, used to manipulate people and under certain circumstances I think a duty of care or loyalty can be used to ring that in in to a degree that in well you can also argue that the FTC's unfairness authority I think could apply to a lot of um, to the use of dark patterns and um, some lawmakers are, are starting to put out um, Bills focusing on dark patterns like um, Mark Warner, and it's not as though there there aren't existing um, legal authorities there, but they're not being used. So, mm. in terms of actually changing uh, changing the incentives for companies to exploit people, um, we want to thank all right, well, even even if the law is there, if it's not actually getting enforced, then what is going to be the law that makes companies take this seriously? Mm, mm, mm. So I, I wonder, Lindsay, I mean, to the extent that you talk about a kind of adopting this information fiduciary paradigm, do you see that as sort of a compromise position between the current U.S. and EU approaches or as a sort of position that might potentially be superior to both of them? I think any and all, because it's, it's, it's also, it's not as though we're in a position where, um, you know, hey, is the U.S. going to just incorporate the GDPR wholesale, you know, tomorrow. One, that's not going to happen. Two, there are, you know, various drawbacks that wouldn't entirely um, coalesce with U.S. law, like, for instance, the right to be forgotten um, while, um, or, the, or the the right of consumers to delete their information under um, most, far more circumstances than the First Amendment would allow. 
um, it's not as though when we're when we're thinking about and, and and frankly it's a very fair question and it's something that I was very um, nervous about in framing the paper in the way that I did because I didn't want to imply that well you know you you pick one model and you sit in that box and that is you know these these are mutually exclusive choices rather the the GDPR reflects you know different approaches to making sure that people have agency in their digital lives and making sure that companies are incentivized to give it to them and not to break the law. Um, information An information fiduciary model can incorporate a lot of the GDPR's, um, a lot of the rights that the GDPR offers people, like in certain circumstances, a right to, to delete, probably not as, not as broad as the GDPR's, um, a right to data portability, a right to access and correct things. Um, and yeah, I, th I think it's, I think it's a, it's a vast improvement to what, um, to our current state of affairs in that it would, in that it is this broader approach to privacy. It restores this moral valence that U.S. privacy discourse and uh, law often lack. Um, but it, it's, this isn't a GDPR sucks paper. It's a, you know, how, how can we implement the objectives of a law that does a lot of good things um, in a way that will also coalesce with kind of U.S. legal principles? Okay. Okay. So in closing, Lindsay, I mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of practical implementation of a sort of information fiduciary approach. I mean, is this the kind of thing that hap has to happen from the top down or, you know, we need like legislation or judges sort of finding a fiduciary obligation on the part of information intermediaries, or is it something that companies could voluntarily adopt? And, you know, to the extent that companies could kind of take this position on a voluntary basis. Have you noticed or seen any companies kind of making moves in that direction? Oh, Lord. Um, yeah, so that that is one um, distinction that I, um, so there have been a lot of critiques about kind of the idea of an information fiduciary. One paper that um, it, it was released kind of late in the publishing cycle, but I tried to address some of the arguments um, is one by um, Lena Khan and David Posen um, appropriately titled um, Information Fiduciary Skepticism or Skepticism on Information Fiduciary, something like that. And um, one thing that I agree with them on is that a an optional designation will not work. Um, and another is, well, I, I don't agree with them on this, is that, but I, I see the concern of the language of um, information fiduciaries is easy to be co-opted in terms of companies making themselves out as these trusted agents. And here you should give us your information because, you know, look how great we are. Um, I think that, um, I, I see the concern, but in a, in a model that is appropriately designed to, you know, with, with, um, penalties for enforcement with a rigorous agency with enough money and people and authority to actually um, bring it to fruition um, with uh, duties that are, if not precisely, um, you know, can, can be more granularly described through regulations, all of that. Um, I think that it is a surmountable problem um, the other concern of, um, yeah, but the other concern of a, um, um, an optional regime being toothless, I think is completely on the money and, um, you know, privacy, these, co these companies have, um, in, in various areas, there've been a bunch of, you know, self-regulatory initiatives and there just aren't incentives for companies to do anything that would really change the ecosystem in the way that it needs to be changed. Um, we need a strong comprehensive privacy law that's actually backed by penalties. And now I'm, you know, I'm also, <laughs> there's, there's a range of, of framing 
proposals in terms of ideal world and the world in which we actually live. Um, I still think that um, <laughs> that um, self-regulation just isn't going to get it done. And we know that because we've seen it before. Look at ad tech, look at, um, you know, there have been a couple attempted codes in various areas that really haven't hampered companies um, companies' practices because they're in a lucrative area and nobody is yelling at them when they break the law and often the law doesn't apply. So um, it would have to be a compulsory regime. Um, another concern that has been um, raised is the fact that fiduciary duties could conflict with shareholder duties. Um, that is, I, I think, an apt concern. And um, you could also write that in a statute to say, well, you know, our the fiduciary duties preempt shareholder duties in these circumstances. Um, the New York Privacy Act. So there, there have been a couple um, legislative approaches to um, implementing fiduciary duties. Um, the Data Care Act um, in the Senate. The it's written by I'm trying to think, it's Brian Schatz and then a, a whole host of others, but um, that would um, apply. Um, I'm pretty sure it is, but uh, the reason I brought up the New York Privacy Act is because it would, um, it says explicitly, you know, in the case of conflict of fiduciary duties conflicting with shareholder duties, um, you know, the fiduciary duties come first. So it's, there's obviously a lot of, <laughs> there, there are some details to be worked out. Um, I also feel pretty confident in terms of the what we know about um, how people make privacy choices, what hasn't worked, what is necessary to kind of reframe uh, the company incentives and just, you know, at this point, years of privacy scholars and privacy and um, policymakers thinking through these issues. Maybe, maybe I'm Pollyanna to Pollyannish to be optimistic, but like I, I think we can figure it out. <laughs> awesome. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was really a fun paper and an illuminating conversation on a extremely timely <laughs> question that I think a lot of people have on their minds right now. No, thank you. Thank you for letting me ramble on and on. I, I listen to the podcast and think it's really great. And it's almost, it's almost confusing to hear, to hear a, vo a voice that I'm accustomed to listening to and then hearing somebody else talk and then realize like, no, no, I have to supply answers now. So <laughs> hopefully I didn't get too confused over, over the course of our discussion. <laughs> Will that be cash or charge? When you buy something, there are two ways you can pay for it, cash or credit. When you pay with cash, you're making one purchase. When you buy on credit, you're really making two purchases. First, you're buying the item you wanted. Second, you're buying the money you need to pay for the item. Credit is not free. You pay for the money you use, either indirectly when the seller raises the cash price or directly when he imposes finance charges. So when you go shopping, shop for a good deal on credit, too. Look for the annual percentage rate and get the lowest rate possible. Don't pay any more than you have to pay. This message is brought to you by the Federal Trade Commission, Washington, D.C.